Well, hello, folks, and welcome back to World War II TV. A bit of a gap since the last show, but this is the concluding part of Jungles Week, all ready for North Africa Week that starts on Monday. And with the shows we've done already this week, the focus has really been on the impact of the terrain, on the operational level of warfare, the strategic level of warfare, the impact on how units dealt with those conditions and overcome the odds there. Um, the final part, we're, we are sort of doing that, but not really. What we're doing is we're focusing on one man's experience of the jungle and how it it led from you know, uh, uh, working with the Chindits to then becoming a prisoner of a Jap the Japanese and the experiences that went through. And his grandson, Daniel Burke, our guest today, is coming on to talk about this process of uncovering his grandfather's story, researching it, going out to the places where his grandfather was, Burma and India. And his book um, is out imminently. It's out right now on Pen and Sword, who have published it. It'll be on Amazon later and then Kindle and other platforms and things as the next few weeks go past. So, Without further ado, I'll invent, invite, uh, introduce my guest, Daniel Burke. So good afternoon, Daniel. How are you today? Very good, Paul. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So it's, well, thanks for coming along. So, you know, it's, it's always cool speaking to someone who's doing a research when it becomes personal, because it just adds that extra level of it's, it's your discovering your own family, as well as discovering a unit that served in the British Army. So it kind of becomes doubly important for you. So, you know, before we get into what your grandfather did and his experiences, how did you come, at what point did you decide to put this down onto paper and what kind of motivated you to put it down on paper? Well, it was probably an accident, really. I, I, um, I knew my grandfather had been in a unit called the Chindits. I knew nothing about them and I knew he'd been a prisoner of war. Um, he didn't like to talk about the war he didn't like to talk about his time as a prisoner and we knew not to push him if, if he ever made a comment he would you know very quickly close it down it was clear he didn't want it to continue so I, i'd kind of forgotten about it um uh, and one day i was uh, traveling to vietnam the next day and i was at my parents house and i saw an old book on their bookshelf and i just I have an attraction to old books. I picked it up and it's called Return via Rangoon by Philip Stibbe. And uh, inside was a, a small inscription in my grandfather's handwriting saying Frank's name, page, whatever. Um, and I looked inside it and it uh, said that he, uh, Private Berkovich, uh, worked as a tailor in the um, Rangoon jail with a, a couple of men working for him, uh, fixing the clothes as they were falling apart. So I thought this was quite interesting. Uh, and I took it with me and uh, read it during the flight to Vietnam. And I was absolutely fascinated by it. It was my first real introduction to the Chindits and quite how tough they were and, and um, some insights into what they went through and what they went through in for those of them that were captured in prison. Um, when I came back, um, I mentioned it to um, my parents. My mum said, I think I've got a... Um, something that he wrote once and uh, she went through her sort of filing wallet and uh, found this uh, document which we think he'd written for a student and it was 13 handwritten pages and um, it was just his memories I think he wrote it in the 80s it was his memories of, of the time over there so I uh, became a little bit obsessed. I started uh, reading more and more. I read some great books by Tony Redding and James Holland. And, and um, uh, um, I spent quite a lot of time looking in um, the Imperial War Museum at their records. There's some great Chindit memoirs in there. Not many, but they're, they're fantastic. Um, one by someone called uh, Frank Leon in particular was, uh, Leon Frank, sorry, was, was fantastic. Um, and uh, I went to Waterstones and bought a very large map of Burma and uh, started to look for some of the villages where he'd passed through uh, or fought. And um, eventually I decided to go on a trip to Burma. And my plan was really to just uh, take photographs. Um, I love photography and uh, go to some of the places he'd been and then put them into a, a sort of book for my children and my brother's children with his memo and um some some notes about what they've done but i suppose as i started writing uh, i decided certain things needed greater explanation like called wingate and uh, mm. it expanded and before i knew it, i was on chapter three so uh, i think i wrote it by accident 
Well, that's perhaps always the best way. And, you know, one of the things when we talk to different authors and, and historians, they've often come at their, the writing process in a different type of way. And Dilip Sarkar, who writes all the aviation books, you know, he was a detective by trade. So he's kind of forensic in his detail, looking at that aspect of it. Other people are teachers. So it's about communicating a story. You know, you're a criminal lawyer. So I, I've, I've always found that a fascinating thing because you deal with truth and what's not truth or rather guilty or not guilty and so when you're looking at accounts and you're reading testimonies and things you know, do you th do you think there's any kind of little extra bit of skill being a lawyer that enables you to kind of gives you if you like a bullshit detector when you're looking at accounts and things like that is that something that you think aided you yes <laughs> that's yeah. good answer. <laughs> um, it, 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 it's i think in terms of um validating sources triangulating information um considering what appears to be um, uh, um, accurate and what may be um, uh, exaggerated i think it makes it does make a difference um i actually found myself looking at the war crimes uh trials for some of the uh officers uh, the guards from rangoon jail one in particular for um uh, I, I hate to even use the word in the same sentence as him, but a, a, a medical uh, doctor uh, who had carried out um, uh, experiments on prisoners and uh, performed um, surgery to the, the worst possible standard. Um, and whilst it was interesting reading those documents, it was also hard. Um, and I'm case hardened. I deal with yeah. you know very very difficult cases, but this was hard. Absolutely, and. Talking about we're going back to your grandfather again because one of the things that you 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 sort of highlight in the book and it, and if even if you don't it kind of comes across is that I think a lot of readers when they think about quote unquote special forces and that term hadn't really been used in World War Two but the Chindits come into that idea with paratroopers and commandos and Merrill's marauders and rangers that they are maybe a certain type you know kind of physically fit and outgoing and adventurous and kind of street brawling type people and your grandfather was sort of a jewish tailor and maybe doesn't fulfill that that kind of stereotypical image so the first yeah. question we begin the present presentation is how did a jewish tailor end up in the chindits also by accident um <laughs> he'd been to a he'd been to a rabbinical school um and they'd had a hard um life his parents had escaped from romania um there were anti-jewish decrees and rampant anti-semitism uh his father had been confined to a secure mental hospital for the rest of his life after world war one we can only imagine why and um one of his brothers um uh, actually had got involved in petty criminality and managed to get murdered um so you know what it, it wasn't an easy life but he'd been to a rabbinical school and then uh, i don't think that was for him he started working as a tailor and um he was simply uh, he wasn't thinking in his late 20s he was drafted into the 13th king's regiment and at the time um they were uh, doing garrison duties and sort of military policeman type work in uh, india and that was probably quite um, uh you know an easy posting uh, compared to what was uh, going on around europe um but at, at this time uh, burma had been very quickly uh, overrun by the japanese there'd been a, a huge retreat and uh, there was a need to gather intelligence and uh, to start some sort of fight back against the japanese and it was simply circumstances that um uh, an officer who will be known to many of your uh, uh, viewers if they've been watching a recent series, uh, Ord Wingate, uh, was suitably um, unconventional, that's him, uh, suitably unconventional and had already tested the waters in uh, pre-state Palestine, Abyssinia and, and uh, initially Sudan of taking small groups of perfectly ordinary men and training them to very high levels of fitness and he had a view that if you led from the front and they would you share your vision with them uh the right people will buy into that vision and they will uh become better than they ever could have imagined they would be and uh, it was those sorts of people he wanted but it was underpinned by this view that it can be done with ordinary men as long as you get the right mm. ones they don't need to have come from um uh commando backgrounds paratrooper backgrounds it, it could be done with anybody 
Um, so he was uh, simply given uh, the 13th King's Regiment and told to basically pick the best of them, uh, mixed in with some Gurkhas, uh, some commandos who, who, who did have uh, significant experience and Burma rifles who would be vital for, for local intelligence. Um, and with the 13th Kings, um, he uh, obviously realised that not all of them would be suitable, whether officers or men, and he set up a, a astonishingly tough selection and training test in um, Madhya Pradesh in central India, in Uttar Pradesh, um, based around a, a fort called Jansi, which has got an incredible history itself. Um, and um, he put them through this this uh, very brutal uh, training. It, it was uh, clear to him that fighting would be in the jungle and there's jungles in that area. There's Orchard, which is thick, beautiful jungle. Um, Bernard Ferguson, one of the Chinnik commanders, called it jungle as it should be. And um, actually, it's where Kipling wrote uh, the Jungle Book, the Palaces of Orchard, and the, the Palaces of the Jungle Book, and another area called Abchand. Uh, but these are very different to the Burmese jungle, but it was the best they could get. He also knew they'd be doing a lot of river crossing, so the men had to train in that. And uh, I've been to the Sonar and Betwa rivers where they trained. And when I went, it was sunny and the waters were still and families were swimming swimming there. But when the um, uh, men of the 13th Kings were going through this selection test, the monsoon uh, seasons were there, the rivers were fast, uh, the Sonar River was deadly and several chindits actually died uh, training in the river. Um, another, another one was blown up uh, with uh, gel ignite, one was killed with a negligent discharge. Um, uh, several died from disease. It, it was a really tough test. Um, every morning would start with um, hand-to-hand -hand combat and bayonet practice. Uh, there was a very tough Welsh uh, sergeant called uh, John Kerr who ended up in Rangoon jail with my grandfather and walked the same road to freedom with him eventually. And uh, he, he taught the men hand-to-hand um, uh, -hand fighting. Uh, and then there would be river crossing and very long marches with increasingly heavy packs going up to 70 pounds. And nobody was um, shouted at. It's very different to sort of full metal jacket where you had a training sergeant screaming and shouting at everybody to climb up things. It was simply a case, uh, Wingate didn't want that. He wanted people that wanted to be in it. So he would set a time for a march. He would set the weights, they would march and they would have to cover 120 miles in X number of days. And if you wanted to drop out, drop out, find your own way back to camp, go back to your original um, unit in India, uh, you, you no longer wanted here. But somehow, Frank just kept up. He resisted the daily temptation that thousands of uh, ranks and officers took to just give up. And um, I suppose over time, muscles toughened, uh, you know, they became increasingly able to bear the weights. Um, he seemed to have been a very good shot because he was selected as a brain gunner um, uh, to, to handle the like machine gun. And um, uh, eventually, um, you know, he made it and, and joined his place amongst the 3,000 men of the first Shinjit expedition. And this is the fascinating thing that, in a sense, validates Wingate's rather unconventional methods. I mean, they don't sound unconventional by 2021 standards because everybody having a say and being a bit more of a, not a democracy, but a kind of open forum where people can exchange ideas and it's up to you to find your motivation mm. sounds very much like any kind of business meeting you go. But in 1943, this is a very different world. You know, the, you know, the airborne forces and the commandos the British trained were by the old tried and tested beasting in pe people until they nearly break and then you kind of rebuild the man well the wingate system is to never break the man at all just have him find in himself this this inherent human ability that they can then utilize and this is something that makes the chindits you talked about the written accounts by tindit chindits it's so i was reading the other day highly educated there's a higher level of education perhaps in your average chindit force and there perhaps there is in the commandos because because of this wider pool of selection they're bringing in where they are bringing people in from maybe an academic background or a scientific background but it created this force that was that was very very unique and although we're not going to dive go down the rabbit hole of discussing or wing it as a human being because he's a very interesting stroke yeah. weird stroke interesting again individual we talked about him with robert lyman a few weeks ago but we're, we're here to understand your grandfather's experience but i think what you just did there, setting the scene of the types of people that ended up in the Chindits is very important to, to for where the story goes next, really, and, and whether people love 
or hate Wingate. He he is an important figure in 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 Burma. He's an important figure in the development of of, of special forces for different types of operation and uh so we, we're going to come to um the first chindi expedition by the way folks daniel and i were talking before going live we're not going to go into the maybe a little bit in passing the merits of how the chindits were used because you get into this operational view of how the the army in burma the military were using forces we're really looking at it in what your your grandfather got out of it and what the people on it had to endure and of course the outcome of it for them so but for those who don't aren't aware, just give us a little kind of, you know, brief on uh, the, the the first big Jindy operation and what its intention was. So it was never going to be um, an operation where there were territorial objectives. There were three thousand Jindits, and um, you can't hold territory with with such a small number. So the aims were really um, twofold or threefold. Sorry. Uh, one was um, to gather intelligence. Um, so the Chindwin River broadly, although there's some territory to the west of it, separates India and, um, and a mountain range separates India and uh, Burma. And uh, India was so important to Britain uh, as the, the sort of jewel in the, in the uh, uh, crown of the empire. Um, and now Japan was on its doorstep. So it, it, Japan was in a very worrying from the English, the British point of view, very worrying position um, uh, geographically. So uh, intelligence was needed about Burma. There were, it was a British colony, so there was intelligence about certain areas where there'd been logging or um, uh, uh, other sort of resource-based activities, but there were huge areas that were just unknown. They'd been of no real interest to Britain. They were just unknown. Um, and uh, particularly on the east of the Irrawaddy, the Irrawaddy is the river that just dissects Burma. Um, uh, th there was very little known. So one um, uh, important role was to, to gather intelligence, to uh, find out what they could about the Japanese strengths, to find out which villages were friendly, which were not friendly where water is located. Water is very hard to find in the jungle. Uh, the east of the Irrawaddy is particularly dry. Uh, that would have a devastating impact on the first expedition, Chinnits. Um, the second uh, job was to cause havoc, um, uh, to blow up bridges, railways, supply lines, attack Japanese garrisons and patrols. Uh, and uh, the third, um, which was partially being done by uh, Stay Behind SOE operatives, um, was propaganda. It was to go into uh, villages, in particular Wingate's own column, brigade column, which my grandfather was in, had this role. It was to go into uh, villages and uh, try to uh, educate the locals, try to uh, persuade them to raise up in rebellion uh, or provide assistance uh, for British soldiers in future. Uh, and Wingate, that's something else he got and was perhaps uh, largely before his time with, was, was hearts and minds. Um, I'm just going to use that very expression, but you beat me to it, Daniel. Yeah. I beat you to it, yeah. He, he um, insisted all men were issued with a number of silver rupees uh, and one of Wingate's maxims for all of his officers was spend money. Uh, you know, use money in these villages, make friends, uh, treat them well. Uh, he, he also made it clear that if any uh, man in his expedition um, uh, behaved improperly towards um, any woman from a Burmese village, he would personally uh, execute them in front of the assembled villagers. Um, uh, so he took it really seriously. So those were really the, the, the three aims. Um, really just cause as much trouble and learn as much as he can. I have to say, for someone who really has t taken this is your first military history, you are explaining this incredibly succinctly and and brilliant better than I know some military historians have. So kudos to you for your your background information on this. And I think it's very important as, to to go back to the, one of the points you made about this this not necessarily trying to take over territory, but to give this message to the Japanese that where you know you've got this huge empire now, but the British, the Allies can strike you wherever you are. Don't don't feel safe. It, it goes into these other things we're doing in the Pacific, you know, the raids on Singapore Harbor and things like that. Is just give the give the enemy the sense that you know 
you, you can never just relax your guard because wherever you are, we can strike. It kind of takes off the, a bit of the idea from church and in, in, in Europe about the, you know, set Europe ablaze and make them on edge. It's a, uh, we're not, we're not ready yet to send an army back into Burma. We've got to build that army first, but while we're building that army, watch out because, you know, we can get you behind the lines. And it's, I think that kind yeah. of aspect of it hasn't been often reminded, you know, we've been reminded of it enough, I think. It, it, there was um, a belief at the time because the Japanese had swept through Malaya, Singapore, um, uh, Burma, and, and there was a belief that they were, uh, well, a commonly used phrase, the supermen of the jungle. Yeah. And um, th there's a lot of debate about whether the first Chintis expedition achieved anything or not. But one thing they did was dispel that myth, and they did that by leaving a staggering enemy body count. Mm. And, and yeah, per perfectly said there. And, and I mean, we're saying before going live, folks, is that whether or not you can measure the, the success of the Chindit operations as what they achieved themselves, they're part of this learning curve that the Allies are, are, are moving up in that theater, uh, you know, um, techniques, training that was implemented later on. But we'll, we'll move on a bit. So, you know, what? tell us about your, you, know, you said your grandfather is with Winger. He's part of that main column there. So what was his role within it? He's obviously not there as a tailor, although being able to sew up shirt, you know, grips in shirts would be quite a useful skill there. But what was his well, role within that? Uh, sadly, his tailoring role did come into use in the um, prison of war camps. We'll talk about that on, later. Yeah. But he, he had um, actually, he seemed to have had two roles in Brigade Column. One was a brain gunner. Yeah. Um, and the other is that at some point um, he became Wingate's Batman, um, which when, when I <laughs> discovered this, I was sort of astonished. Um, I'd read a document that had been working in the uh, officer's mess during the training period. Um, I think it may come down to uh, Wingate himself. Um, uh, for those who don't know, uh, watching this, I imagine most do, but a Batman is, a, you know, essentially uh, an orderly uh, assistant, run messages, that, that sort of thing. Um, uh, but Wingate was a, a deeply uh, religious uh, Christian, a Plymouth Brethren, and uh, knew the Old Testament very, very well. Um, uh, the Old Testament very well. And he had been uh, stationed in uh, Israel in pre-state Palestine. Um, he had declared himself a, a Zionist to become friends with members of the Yeshuv, the, which was a provincial government at the time, provisional government at the time. And um, when he was in um, uh, Palestine, he had become, you know, the, the Bible was was alive around him. You know, this is where um, Gideon chose his 300 to fight the Midianites. And that's where he based himself with his special night squads of the kibbutz uh, Ein Harod, or where uh, Deborah, you know, called a chariot. So it was just alive around him. Um, and I think he was probably um, uh, attracted to my grandfather as somebody who was from, you know, a rabbinical school who um, also had, uh, you know, a deep knowledge of the Old Testament through his uh, Jewish faith. So um, I think that was uh, probably a connection between them. But for that's only my assumption. Ultimately, you know, he, he was chosen as Wingate's Batman. And it it makes sense to me. And, and, and we know that Wingate was very, he didn't just want to talk, you know, Bren guns and tactics. He was very, very um, enlightened, wanted to understand the world and cultures and, and other people's and belief systems. And, you know, I, I can imagine him, Wingate and your grandfather kind of having these deep philosophical conversations whilst kind of trudging through the jungle. But but also with a brain and a Batman, particularly in you know, Batman in the in the um in the kind of the training environment is very much kind of pressing uniforms and polishing shoes and making sure one's cocoa is ready. But in the environment of a chind economy, it's a much more um personal, dependent relationship of uh, uh, the, uh, on a real connect connected level because the jungle is a, is no respecter of rank. Everybody's going to have leeches on their ass as they go through water. Everybody's wow. going to be short of supply. Everyone's going to be hungry. You know, the, whether or not you're a general or a private, everybody's dealing with exactly the same situation. So, and, and we know, as you said earlier, Wingate doesn't, it has a rank structure, of course, but it's slightly more loose and informal the way the Chindits work. It's, it's, a, hmm. it's a team building exercise where everyone's everyone is a valued part of this team so when you were going back to how you know you you, you said your grandfather left these 13 pages of, of memoirs and you used other people's uh you know accounts and tony redding and the archives and so how difficult was it to kind of piece together 
exactly your grandfather's kind of experiences on this column or did you have to kind of use a bit of other people's to, to flesh it out um it, it it was um it was a mix i mean the 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 um the memo was the the base uh, mm. and that's what i'd always sort of track back to and my large uh, map of burma which spent so long on our dining table that my uh, wife used to just sort of set the table on top of it uh but um the the memo is quite scant and um he, he speaks in um uh you know such sparse language it will make uh, hemingway blush and um so it gave us some information but not enough so we did go to other sources um and i looked at, um we obtained some information from forces war records and and they um from his capture card uh considered that um they could place him in eight column because he'd been captured well he hadn't been captured there but on his capture card he said he'd been captured on a particular date in a place called ball b-a-w um and now it turns out that was actually just a lazy um japanese officer when he was taken to the prison camp and just you know filled in a particular date and place but that wasn't actually where he'd been captured um and but on the face of it you know some men from a column had been in the battle there and and they assumed had been captured there uh, that wasn't correct it didn't match what he was saying in his memo which was that he'd been captured on the banks of the irrawaddy um so the kenji characters on the back of the capture card um a great chindit researcher stephen fogden whose own uh, grandfather arthur leslie howne he, uh, sadly died in rangoon jail was very possibly buried by mine um sent the capture card to a friend of his who speaks japanese and he said no the place of capture was a, a place called twingay um so uh that enable we eventually i managed to find that on on google earth a tiny village it's not not on maps but it was on google earth um uh i was able to see where that was and then sometimes in the imperial war museum archives uh two people dennis goodgen who was an officer um remembered my grandfather praying every day in the prisoner of war camp and uh leon frank another chindit um you know remembered a sort of anecdote that he used to fold his hat up and sleep on a log with it and it looked like napoleon the next day so i'd, I'd find these little snippets or occasionally he'd be mentioned in a book um uh and you know whenever i found something it was like finding treasure was... mm. and and this you know this is the thing we you know we i'm going to say to the folks yeah you know, we're not going to do all the best stories best in terms of drama in today's show because you should all, all out ugh, you should all go out and buy the book and on the subject of buying the book daniel i think it's a pertinent moment to mention the fact that you're putting the proceeds towards a particular cause that you, you you're you're passionate about so to tell the viewers where the royalties are going for, for the book well i suppose it, the, the, all the royalties are going to a charity called veterans in action um when um if you read the book my, grandfather suffered of course they all did in the jungles but in the um pow uh camps um they suffered very badly um th there are some appalling examples of cruelty um torture slave labor um uh even human experiments um what's encouraging though is for every example of cruelty there's a a greater example of other prisoners doing what they could to help each other mm. uh, my grandfather gives examples of them trying to smuggle food into the camp there's a, a wonderful uh, british medical officer called dr ramsey who, who saves so many lives and, and would frequently be beaten up and thrown into um, solitary uh, and i think that was quite heartwarming but when he eventually got back to england he was broken and i don't know i can't imagine my grandfather was a soldier. I can't, even though I've been to Burma, I've looked around where he trained in India. I, I, I just can't project that image. I can see him. He worked, for example, in the makeshift hospital in, in Rangoon jail. And I can see him caring for people. I can see him doing things like that. But I, I can't see him as a sort of, you know, commando. Um, the person I knew was quiet, nervous. Um, I heard a, an anecdote of a relative of mine uh, who said that when uh, he, he was a boy in the 50s he'd been to my grandfather's house and um uh, this isn't in the book he told me recently after we read the book um 
he suddenly had his head in his hands and started shaking and screaming to his wife, Millie, to turn the tap off, turn the tap off, uh, because it was dripping. And that's haunted me for the last couple of days. Um, whatever happened to him, when he came back, he was broken and there was no support, none. Sleep didn't come easily to him. When he was in the camps, he would dread waking up. And when he came back, he would dread going to sleep. Because when he did, he was haunted by nightmares. And, and that was with him all his life. And um, th there was just no help. Um, today, there is help. Uh, there are soldiers who go through, um, you know, dreadful experiences uh, in more recent conflicts. Uh, and there is help available to them. It, uh, it's just not always as, as well funded as it should be. Um, I often sort of wonder why my grandfather didn't talk to me uh, or to anybody about this. I don't think that he didn't want to. I don't think he knew how. Yeah. And I don't think as well that he would have expected that any of us could have possibly, how could you possibly understand what they went through? Um, so what Veterans in Action does, they build Land Rovers together, veterans with, with mental injuries, physical injuries, and then they go off on adventures together and they do good things. But when they're on those adventures, they're together with other people that have been through it. And they're together with some people who are very skilled in dealing with these sorts of issues. And they're supported, they can speak to each other, they don't feel alone, they can open up and um, it makes a tremendous difference. So it's such a simple concept, but it's so effective. Mm. So uh, yeah, the royalties uh, from selling of this book go into Veterans in Action. Well, I mean, it's just an amazing it. cause. And we, you know, we did a whole week of on about uh, me medics in World War II. And one of the shows was about the history of PTSD as we now label it. But there's, of course, other, other variations of it. There's spectrums of different types of problems and issues that people deal with but you're, you're absolutely right there it's not it's a combination of the the, the the people coming back from these experiences not knowing their how to communicate about it and they're not being a mechanism to deal with the fact they want to communicate it or don't want to communicate about it but now thankfully we do have a bit of a track record of looking back and understanding it now post vietnam and onwards so there is the, there are these mechanisms there but but and again, I don't want to focus too much about the, the experience. You know, we, we so you let, let's quickly recap. You know how your grandfather came to be to be captured. We don't necessarily need to go through the whole experiences of the of the, of the prison camps and what have you, but we can do a little bit of that. But I because I want to move on at a certain point to your experiences going to Burma and India because that yeah. is much more interesting and it's in the sense that they can get the other stories from the, from the book. But well, the kind of, yeah. You know, briefly uh, I, 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 explain, explain the, the capture and then we can move on. Yeah, I, I won't give away too much, but um, the um, Chindits did push on to the east bank of the Irrawaddy, they crossed the Irrawaddy, and it was a river too far probably, but as I say, intelligence was needed from there. But they were finding it very hard to get water. Um, they were resupplied, the Chindits were entirely resupplied by air. It was, it, they tried supplement with food from the jungle, but it wasn't easy going. Um, and the RAF was now flying at its absolute limits. The monsoon rains were closing in. Um, they were cut off by the uh, Irrawaddy River and its sort of confluence with the Shwelly. And there was a very large, very angry Japanese force now closing in on them. So uh, there was now a need to get all the intelligence they got back to India. And Wingate determined the best way to do that was to split into small dispersal groups. My grandfather's group was maybe, you know, seven, eight, nine. Um, uh, they went to um, uh, uh, as a force uh, together to the Irrawaddy. Uh, they tried to cross. Um, uh, they um, uh, tried to cross, and uh, Japanese machine guns opened up, so they split into dispersal groups. My grandfather's group went south. Um, they were chased the whole way. Um, the villages on the banks of the Irrawaddy had been occupied now by the Japanese. Um, he picked the wrong village. They were ambushed. His sergeant uh, was killed. The others were wounded, and he went to two years of captivity. Mm. Uh, and you know, your book goes through the fact that you know your your family deal with the situation of missing and and, and not knowing it. And that, you know, and it, again, it's it's so important when we're looking at these operations that that fail. You, 
that, that there's this all this impact on families because we now, in looking at it with all these years on, we can say, well, this happened. They got this telegram on this month, this one, this month, and then we can piece it together. At the time, people are going weeks, months, years without information. It's and it, it, it's it, it's staggering to think that there is was so little information coming out of this theatre. I mean, it's one of the things when we talk about in Normandy. If you were a British soldier wounded on June the 6th in D-Day, your family were probably aware of you being wounded almost within 24, 48 hours of that occurring. But in the Far East, in Burma, it's it's days, weeks, months. Information is lacking. Uh, the accuracy of the information is is often not there. And you know, the, for the family back home, it just would, must have been just an awful time there. At least, I suppose, in a weird way, if you are in a camp yourself, as, as terrible as your deal ordeal is, you know what, where you are and what's happening to yeah. you. But for the families back home, the unknowing is, in some ways, even worse. So, so going away from your grandfather for a second, how, how do yeah. your your family deal with the the, the fact that uh, someone just goes missing in the middle of the war? So my great grandmother, I mean, she she received uh, you know a knock on the door and she was handed an official envelope and uh, ma you know, madam, we regret to inform you. Um, and uh, you know, I imagine she collapsed. Um, I wonder whether her daughters were there uh, or friends. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that's actually the, the letter she received. Um, and um, uh, there was no information, but it seems that she started writing letters. Um, there's a joke about Jewish mothers, and it's the difference between a Jewish mother and a Rottweiler is the Rottweiler will eventually let go. Uh, I, I, I have one, so I'll speak from authority. And um, uh, But she started writing letters, and she, she wrote uh, numerous letters, and eventually one of her letters, which I think was the one before this uh, letter, Paul, um, she actually wrote to Ord Wingate himself. Uh, and this is at a time, 10th of November, 43, um when he was preparing for the the much larger uh chindit expedition uh, operation thursday the second expedition of 1944 uh and he took time to write to her and um again this was just buried in a load of family documents and talk about finding treasure uh, to me this was greater and this uh letter really gives an insight into for all the criticism wingate faced and my grandfather i, I do know was a, a big supporter of his um uh, this was a letter that he wrote to the mother of a private soldier while he was planning for a huge expedition. Um, he calls my grandfather his friend. He offers uh, financial support to her and to try and find out what he can. But uh, as you say, uh, he, he does uh, mention it. You know, it, it can be months of delay that, that, until we find anything out. So uh, all, all of her sons were away in the army. Her husband was, as I say, in a, a mental institute after World War I. Um, and she, she wasn't the only one. The country was filled with um, mothers, daughters, sisters, fathers who were in this appalling uh, situation, not knowing what on earth had happened to their loved ones. And we'll 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 kind of skip. I mean, all we need to say today in today's show is that his experiences in 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 Rangoon and the other things that happened to him during his captivity were, as you would expect, uh, harrowing, um, lack of food, lack of awful conditions. But yeah, as you say, and and I would like to kind of emphasize that those who read the book, there are these moments of optimism you know, these moments of compassion the human compassion that comes out of these situations of people sharing what they have with each other and a bond and a spirit and and perhaps those who've been within the chindits maybe had a little bit more of that than and being captured later perhaps people who were captured in 1941 in singapore and different places perhaps their their will was 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 lapsing by 1943 but someone who was part of the chindits they're feeling important they're feeling valued they're feeling that they're they're in good physical condition maybe there's a mental a mental strength as well that, that helps them out but you know we'll we, you know for those who want to go to the details of the of him using his tailoring skills and the compassion and the, and the caring we, we can we, that's all in the book there but let, let's move on uh, to and to the war crimes aspect because i think that's something that's really interesting and 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 what happened to some of the people who perpetrated some of these crimes and then we'll move on as pretty swift, swiftly to your experiences traveling to where your grandfather fought because i think that's really really interesting yeah i mean so this um son of a bitch uh was a lieutenant called uh, onishi who um 
was the medical uh, officer I mentioned earlier uh, had been um, th th there was um, a, a unit of the Japanese army which was um, uh, known to carry out medical experiments they, they were medical experiments to carry out experiments on humans um, uh, and it was suggested that this had some some value uh, um, there were numerous examples of live vivisection on Australian prisoners um, uh, this um, uh, cretin decided to try it and um, uh, amputate uh, a limb of a prisoner and then gave up part way through the operation uh, saying I didn't realize it would be that difficult um, which just sort of shows his, his um, uh, total incompetence and idiocy um, uh, two British doctors um, however you know were able to take over and, and successfully perform the operation and that soldier actually survived the war um, uh, so uh, one, one awful thing I mentioned it briefly in the book is that the person who was behind uh, this uh, Japanese unit um, in a, a rather um, appalling example of real politic uh, was uh, pardoned by General MacArthur after World War II because they uh, wanted you know the findings of his uh, experiments well wow. and well, well before yeah we'll move into the your experience traveling back but when when the war comes to an end you know you, obviously your grandfather has everybody who's been through this their health has been impacted that we know already because you've explained it his his mental well-being was affected effectively for the rest of his life on that but you know when, when you know the war crimes and things like that became news in 45 and 46 and you know what was do you think your grandfather came back bitter angry um solemn bit, bit of everything um how do you think he dealt with those immediate sort of two or three years after the war well um from what i can gather um you know a guillotine came down he just you know tried his best to move on uh, he set up a small tailoring um uh, business he married uh, he had two children in the 40s two sons um, and tried his best to you know get on with life he, he you know bought a house built a home um, uh, worked the rest of his days as a tailor and consistently bet on slow horses and uh, you know he's got through it but he, he just um, you know he, he was quiet he, he was clearly as all the men of the first <laughs> Chinda expedition was capable and perhaps would have been capable of great things but um he, the person i knew was was quiet nervous pious he was in the synagogue every day um who knows what he would have become otherwise but um mm. you know if he wouldn't have been captured um but he was but he didn't you know live long enough ultimately to reach that phase i was talking to tony redding about it on the chindit show a few months ago of the we are in an era now of of reconciliation and examination and looking at things like you know compensation and there's discussions between various governments about these horrific acts do you do, do you think he would have been um i mean i I'm, I'm, I'm shouldn't be asking you to second guess about something that your grand you can't really say about your grandfather but do, this era of of people actually showing an interest in it because that's the thing that for many many decades really it was the forgotten campaign everyone everyone was focusing on normandy and market garden mm. and things like that and burma was just dropped off the radar for decades and now we have people like robert lyman and james holland and many others now highlighting this campaign so it would be interesting if he'd lived long enough to see some of this re reinterest and reevaluation of the campaign both on a military level but also this idea of the cruelty and forgiveness and you know we've, we we know there are tales of veterans who went out to the far east and laid wreaths and met japanese people and met things like that but you know your grandfather couldn't do that but the point is you could so you know you said there right at the beginning of the show we'll, we'll, we'll talk about your visit out there you know this was during the writing process but it's also i'm assuming it's part of your understanding of of, of how your grandfather endured this and what he went through so when it what was it like for you going out that's a really crass way and that's a, like a bad hospital it's... radio interview question there. <laughs> well, how did you feel when you went out there daniel but really how did you feel when you went out there daniel uh look it was um a complex mix of feelings it was exciting you know it's a great place to 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 visit and when i went there um 
Burma was briefly a fragile democracy. Uh, Aung San Suu Kyi was in a power sharing uh, arrangement with the military, but they were still very powerful there. Um, and sadly, it's no longer a democracy. Um, uh, so it was exciting, but, but there was a degree of trepidation. I knew that he'd suffered there. And I knew that also, uh, you know, it, there were probably parts of it that, you know, he, he'd found rewarding. Um, uh, so um, it, it was fascinating. It's, it's like a, hard to explain, it's the most fantastic uh, country. Um, uh, much of it hasn't changed. And some of the villages that he uh, marched through or fought at, such as uh, anywhere, uh, the Shweli Valley or Bonchang, where they blew up bridges, there's still houses on bamboo stilts with subsidence farming providing for the villagers. And um, in two of the villages, I went, this is the village of Iniwa. And um, the, the Chindits passed through here. And, uh, it, it, you know, it, that hasn't changed. And um, uh, although they've all got Facebook, the solar panels and they've all got Facebook, which is great, but otherwise it's not changed. And uh, I was told in this village and also in a village called Wall, which is where he was liberated, I was actually the first Westerner to go there since the war, um, which I, I thought was, was quite cool. Um, uh, so, yeah, it, it, it was special. My, my plan was to find old people uh, who yeah. may remember the war, and I did actually find a couple. Uh, this chap's called Utun Sain. Uh, he was in his 80s. He's from the village of Iniwa. Iniwa was actually um, a village which was quite friendly towards the Japanese. There were Burmese Defence Army there. And um, he was a novice monk when he was a boy, and he remembered the Japanese uh, occupation quite fondly. Um, and uh, he was one of several that I met. Uh, others had um, uh, less warm memories. And this is the thing that I found intriguing, you know, reading your book and, and, and you know, talking to you in emails and, and, and just talking to you today is that a military historian might just go back there and look at terrain, look at, look at you know, what's it like, how far, how wide is that river, what would have been like crossing. You, you were in a, in, a, in a very obvious way trying to replicate somewhat of the hearts and minds aspect you were going to try and create a bond with these villages talk to them speak to them i don't know that you had the silver guineas perhaps from the british army to offer to people but it, it, it did seem to me that it was important to you to to try and try and do the same sort of things just be there explain who you are why you're there and, and create some kind of bond with it with, with these people who had who had been in the same place as your grandfather in, in as you said there the same kind of huts the same trail the same rivers the same trees and things so extra extraordinary um program your photographs are just incredible but you no know, well, takeaways you know well, this this is burma we're looking at first and you also went to india so you know if i had to put you on the spot and say you know to, obviously going there brings you a little bit closer to your grandfather's experiences and just the, you know, the humidity and uh, and jabs and disease and creepy crawlers and things. But give me a couple of kind of takeaways that will live with you. As, and, you know, you're going to raise your children. Well, live with you. th th these two sisters, I find, you know, I travel quite a lot. And wherever I travel, I, I seem to find that, you know, the poorer the area, they're, they're sometimes more welcoming and kind than people can be. Uh, these were two sisters, um, uh, twins, who... Uh, again, remembered the occupation. They were young girls, uh, and they uh, remembered um, uh, um, uh, men from the village uh, having to line up and uh, have their faces slapped by uh, Japanese guards. So say le less war memories. Um, they are uh, they grow peanuts and harvest them, and they, they uh, uh, insisted on me joining them for dinner with their family. And um, uh, wherever I went, apart from one village, I found the people to be. Um, uh, you know, really warm and inviting. I found myself sleeping on the floor of a monastery one day and playing football with novice monks. It was, you know, really um, uh, quite special. The only place where I actually had a, a run in with anybody um, uh, well, uh, was uh, actually the village of Twingay, which was the village where my grandfather was captured, uh, which was probably, I don't know the precise date, early April in 43. And um, uh, the, that was one of the areas that was just off limits that you, you need permission to go to certain areas often if there's um uh, logging going on lots of chinese logging or, or jade mines or uh, military operations such as um, uh, the rohingya uh, areas and what's going on there so twingo was one where i was turned back but the i don't know if it was a guard or a policeman he was really drunk and he was 
quite aggressive and he wanted my passport. We ended up having a bit of a row. And uh, I thought, I'm going to do if I get arrested in the same village my grandfather was. Um, would make a good extra chapter to the book, though, wouldn't it? The 10 years yeah. you spent in captivity whilst researching a book would guarantee you a bestseller, I think. No, wouldn't it? Ex yeah, exactly. Although I don't want to think I want to write. This village was Pien Luin and uh, or, or Maymeo, Maytown, named after um, Colonel May. And um, uh, this is, uh, th there was a prisoner of war camp here, and that was one of the buildings where the prisoners uh, were probably held. Um, uh, and it, it um, I couldn't get in there. There was a fence, it was locked. But um, this was where prisoners were taken to learn to uh, submit to Japanese supremacy. It was where they would learn commands in Japanese, learn to number off, learn to, you know, bow, medical experiments took place on prisoners here uh it, it was brutal uh, numerous beatings uh, and I, when i got there actually uh, you talk about feelings and um i remember feeling quite irritated that there was nothing there to mark what had happened there and then i kind of had a word with myself i thought well you know why should there be you know th th these were sort of local peaceful people going about their you know sort of farming business and two imperial powers turn up there and decide to fight it out in, in their backyard. Um, you know, why should they? Um, uh, but yeah, that, that was one I found, I actually found this era was quite uh, upset and on edge. Um, although I did meet uh, a wonderful woman when I was crossing the railway on the Pritchard before, who came up to me and uh, asked if I was English. And it, uh, she's an English teacher. Uh, she was called um, uh, Serena Flock. Her uh, grandfather was a, a an Irish guy who had been working over there after the war and stayed and married a local lady and uh, you know she was just one of life's better people just a wonderful person who mm. uh, either taught in uh, a school uh, or spent the weekends teaching at an orphanage so I found myself teaching English to uh, uh, the kids in her class for the day and uh, she took me to an Anglican church and there was a plaque there uh, commemorating the first uh, service uh, after the after the Japanese occupation. Wow, wow, and you know, for those who've you know, I, I haven't ever travelled that part of the world. I mean, it's you know, Robert Lyman has, James Bond has, and it's you know, it's clearly the kind of place that leaves an impression on you if you don't have a family connection of of as you do something pretty horrific happening. But if you do have that connection, I mean, what a what an amazing, uh, amazing experience, as you said there, with well, all those different experiences of, 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 of the beauty of the place, the, the, the horror of some of the things that happened there. And as you said, the, in a sense, ambivalence of the locals. But uh, we get that in Normandy when people, some of the tourists are very, they, 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 they're offended at the fact that life's going on again. Why are these people hanging on the beach playing volleyball? They go, well, why should do, do, you're, you're meant, are they meant to stay there? forever and ever and ever with their ha heads bowed in reverence as what happened there or does does life go on and and mm. joy come back and that's that's surely what it's all about that's what your grandfather did what he did for that was his being part of something whether that uh Chindi expedition achieved what it was supposed to or not he was willing to put his life on the line willing to do his bit for to make the world a better place it's a cliche but it's absolutely true isn't it that's correct. Um, uh, th this village actually was war. That's the village where he was liberated. Um, you know, it's it's not it's not on maps. So we had to sort of search around and find it. And um, uh, again, extremely friendly people. Um, I met another old man in there who remembered. Uh, yes, yeah, um, uh, 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 he um, uh, remembered. Um, uh, the uh, men from the village going to sort of um, help British soldiers chase off the remaining Japanese. Um, uh, so to, to be able to go to that village where my grandfather was liberated was um, special. And, you know, we, we must discuss the fact that, of course, there are cemeteries out there. There are markers and things like that. So, you know, you're, you, the book goes into some quite detail about some of the you know, the, the, obviously people die and there are there are there are then they're not nice deaths dying in the jungle everything is made worse and infection both on the chindit side of things and in the prison war camps and you know so you know your grandfather obviously never went back on this pilgrimage there in his life but you you were there so did, you know were you carrying the the family being there on behalf of the family and that how how important was that for you to kind of pay your respects to the other people because you know you 
your grandfather may have had a, a not a less than perfect life after all, in that he had all these 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 hidden trauma. But he he did come back. He did raise a he did come back that, life. So that, those who didn't, um, you know, what what was it like walking around there? And what 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 were your takeaways? Well, he, he did come back, and and he was able to have a family, and uh, you know, it's now a large family. Um, and I like to think we've all tried to go on to do good things, but he was very much in my mind was over here. Now this Tao Kian uh, War Cemetery in Rangoon, every single one of those columns you can see has got names on. Uh, there are 7,000 graves, there are 27,000 names on the columns uh, where they have no known graves. Um, um, but for him somehow finding the strength to just put one foot in front of another and not give up and a dose of sheer luck, he would have been one of those names. He would have been in one of those graves. Um, uh, and I found being in that cemetery hard, just just the, the scale of loss. Um, there were a couple of names that it's explained in the book, but uh, were important to me that I wanted mm. to find. Um, I, I found them high up on those columns. Um, there were graves of Victoria Cross winners, um, uh, uh, one called Almond, one called Cairns. Um, uh, one of those from the, the second Chindis expedition had been in a battle at a place called Pagoda Hill. And uh, to give an idea of the ferocity of the fighting, it had his arm uh, more or less severed by a Japanese samurai sword. He, he killed the officer, took his sword, and went on to kill a couple of other men before he died of wounds. But, uh, you know, he won the Victoria Cross, he lost his life. And th there were just so many graves of unknown soldiers, you know, the graves say known unto God. Um, there were Muslim graves, there were Jewish graves, there were Christian graves, there were Nigerian graves, the, the Nigerian Spider-Men, uh, um, you know, a force that fought with the second Chinda expedition, uh, Canadian, Australian, uh, Burmese. It was just this huge scale and, you know, the sort of sharing the uh, earth and, um, you know, if anyone does go to Burma and I hope that democracy comes back again and people can go again. Mm. You know, I, I strongly recommend it as a place to visit. And you know, the, the, as we as we've discussed, I mean, it's 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 more than just your grandfather's biography. It, it's it's about your journey as well. It's a, it's very much a, a book for our age now of of looking back and understanding where we are. And it's I, I was thinking this morning when I do my prep for this, it's a it's a pity when you go to bookshops that we're limited with this book will be in the military section because it could also be yeah. in the self-help section or the, uh, the interesting lives section or the philosophy section because it, it like, uh, uh, and I'm just giving praise to you because I did enjoy reading it. it, it although as harrowing as it was at times, you, you feel, I felt there was this takeaway of optimism coming out of it as well. And that you, you whilst read, while reading it, while writing it, sorry, we're, we're on a, your own journey again using really bad interviewing cliches there but you were and uh, and so you know we're in the point you know it's out on a pen and sword now it'll be out on other platforms later on what what would you like what type of reader would you like to be taking something away from it because i mean obviously there's the people who read the robert lyman the james holland but it, it is more than that so what what are your hopes well w when i wrote it i i didn't want it to be a history book um because some people like history books and some don't i certainly didn't want it to be um indulgent or about me in any way uh, and i hope it isn't um uh but somewhere in there um is a story of an ordinary man who was just pitched into the most ruthless, unforgiving campaign and circumstances that, that we can imagine that took him and those with whom he fought, actually on both sides, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, Japanese and British, um, you know, into it, these extraordinary circumstances and somehow managed to get through it, not unscathed. And um, to me, I think it's a story about human spirit mm. and empathy. yeah no absolutely and, and that's 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 gonna be the takeaway and you know the question just came up there about you know was there any anti-semitism and things like that and i just i don't think no. i want to go down that path even if well I'm, I'm happy to actually because okay well let's, let's go uh, down uh, that path then you know yeah, that, 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 that is an aspect that we know we're now 
talking about the fact that the British forces and in World War II and other forces were, were multicultural, multi-religion. And, you know, we, we talked a little bit about togetherness in camps. But, yeah, be, being well, a Jew well, in the British well, Army can be, can well, be tricky. Well, well it, it, it could have been. My, my great-grandfather, who was in Gallipoli, found himself locked in prison for thumping uh, an officer for saying something anti-Semitic. But my... Uh, um grandfather didn't have any such problems and interestingly when i've read books about other special forces such as the sas you hear that there's no problems with any racism in there because they're too bright and there's 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 too much respect for each other and i think it was the same in the chindits and one of the stories that i found at the imperial war museum was um an officer just talking of a memory he said um that there was one uh gentleman a member of the jewish faith and he was very um uh, religious and he would pray every day in the camp and sometimes it would get noisy and I'd say quiet everybody there's a man praying I, I, and I, I just I think that um, the Chindits they, they were just selected very well they had yeah. um, brains they relied on each other and what counted was um, uh, your character um, that, that, that's that's a very good point because with some special forces the way of bonding them is in actual fact to kind of create hatred for the enemy that's the you know or, or create hatred for the sergeant major who trains you first and then transpose that hatred to the enemy and it's all about this aggressive um spirit but the, 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 you know my reading of the chindit it's about a, a bond amongst the men first we are very good at what we do we have a set of skills we we have come together we're, we're from different walks of life and we will do our well our job well but perhaps without the aggression although you of course you need to have aggression to win a war but the chindits are something different like in that regard and that's partly wingett's own yeah. um, um influence over it and as you say there very the, the type of men that ended up in it it was a slightly broader broader recruitment pool and they had been through some the, just the, as you say the training alone is a bonding experience that if you go anyone who's got through that you're part of that team aren't you whether you're you know, black, white, old, young, you know, not the really old people, but you know what I mean? Yeah. You, you've become this, this body of brothers. people, regardless of your, of your background, your brothers, the band of brothers, as you say. So, mm. um, yeah, very fa fascinating insight into, into one person's experience. And, and yeah, I, I, I personally, I hope you continue with military history and the uh, uh, <laughs> criminal, law, criminal laws gay, uh, gain is military history's loss. I think right now, because we've got a very, um, um, clear style of, of 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 taking these facts and, and making it very understandable and very readable. So um, I hope you have huge success with it. Thank you very much. Well, I think we'll bring it to end there. I'll just remind people what we've got coming up next week, and I'll come and say goodbye to you in a second. So, folks, that was the last of Jungles Week. Uh, I remind everybody, of course, please check us out on Twitter. Please consider becoming a patron. Uh, Daniel's Twitter account uh, can be available. The book can be available from various sources, Pen and Sword right now, Amazon, what have you, uh, bookstore links in the, in, the, in the description below. As usual, um, I urge you to read more about the Chindits. We've got our own shows about the Chindits. Robert, Robert Lyman talks about Wingit, so go back into our back catalog and have a look at that other than that north africa week starts next week on monday uh ken delve is talking about desert air force's first show then we've got another three it's just just four shows in desert air force week i'm uh, sorry in, in north africa week i'm giving myself a little bit of a weekend off the next one but that please come back for that but right now i say it just remains me to say thank you very much daniel burke for joining us and i hope you enjoyed chatting to me as much as i enjoy chatting to you i really have thank you Thank you and um, as I said, I, I wish you every success with the book because it, it, it deserves to, to be one of those ones that is read by not just people who want to read about Burma and World War II, people who want to understand a little bit about uh, people going through hard uh, situations and, and coming out the other end, uh, because that's ultimately what the story is. It's survival, isn't it? Even if you've been affected by something and you're not the same person you were you're still there you're still alive and kicking and i think that's that's the, the my takeaway from the book yes brilliant well okay then this is paul Bernard from world war ii tv saying enjoy your weekend everybody i will see you on monday for north africa week thank you very much for watching thank you